Welcome to Work Better, the podcast where we think about work and ways to make it better. I'm your host, Chris Congdon, Editor-in-Chief of Work Better Magazine. So here's a question. Can a robot take your job? It's not such a crazy question anymore. I mean, even writers like me are watching as AI takes a bigger and bigger bite out of the work that we all do. So our guest today, Kevin Roos, says you can do things to bring more of your humanity to work and to keep those robots at bay. Kevin's a New York Times technology writer based in Silicon Valley, and he also wrote a book called Future Proof, Nine Rules for Humans in the Age of Automation. And we followed Kevin's work for years, and it's it's great because he's so close to all the advantages that technology brings, and yet he always seems to come back to what makes humans unique. After we hear from Kevin, stick around for our chat with Michael Held, and he's our vice president of global design at Steelcase. He wrote an article a couple years ago about whether creative AI could actually make designers redundant. And so we knew that he was the perfect person to help us connect to what Kevin has to say about our workplaces. So let's get started. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me. We're pleased you're here. So, Kevin, you are a technology columnist, and yet your work tends to kind of wind back to humanity. So I want to talk about that with you today. But I want to start by just setting for the audience some terminology that we might use throughout the conversation, because not everybody has your kind of background in technology. So we're all on the same page. How would you define AI and automation? It's a tricky question. Uh, we started started hard. Because um, so, AI and the way that people use terms like AI and automation really varies. Some people, um, you know, a lot of computer scientists think that AI refers to only sort of computer programs that can learn on their own, right? That aren't just carrying out pre-programmed instructions. Um, things like deep learning um, and neural networks would fit into that category. But, you know, people use AI for all kinds of things. For, you know, Siri, people consider things like dishwashers a robot that lives in your house. So there's really a wide range from very prosaic to very sophisticated. So in in the book, I just use the ca- sort of catch-all category like AI and automation to describe sort of any process that is uh, that is done by machines that used to be done exclusively by humans. Okay, that's super helpful. Yeah, I, I agree. There are some devices that have just become standard in our house that are a lot smarter than uh, sometimes I even want them to be. Uh, <laughs> There's a, a technologist who likes to say that it's AI until it works. In which yeah. <laughs> case, it's just a washing machine or just a dishwasher or just a you know Roomba or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So going back before the pandemic, there was a lot that was getting written about AI and automation. And there was just a lot of speculation about the impact that that was going to have on the world, on society, and on business. And there was a lot of speculation that jobs you know, would be lost as a result of automation. But yet here we're sitting in 2022, and yet we've got all kinds of jobs that are open. And I'm just curious, you know, what happened there? Well, a couple possibilities. Um, One is, uh, you know, historically, a lot of big leaps forward in automation come during recessions. So, Mm. you know, companies are tightening their belts, they're looking for ways to cut costs, and they might, you know, bring in a robot to replace some of the people on their assembly line, or they might automate some back office process that they've been meaning to get to. But, you know, when the economy's good and your company's flush with cash, maybe you don't feel as much pressure to, you know, wring every bit of savings out as you can. So it's possible that if we do enter a recession in the next few years, that there will be more companies saying, maybe now is the time to deploy that automation that we've been thinking about for years. Mm -hmm. Um, Another uh, one, and this is one that I I learned in the course of researching this book, is this theory of so-so automation. And this was a term coined by uh, two economists who have this great paper um, about basically the kind of automation that is only mediocre. It's not sort of a huge leap forward in automation that allows 
companies to be significantly more productive or, you know, cut entire departments worth of people. It's not world changing automation. It's, it's sort of mediocre improvements in processes or outcomes. Um, and so like a, you know, a good example of this is like the customer support automated voice thing that you get when you call an airline or a, you know, insurance company or something. And a lot of the time, like the robot's just not very good. It can't get you what you need. And so you end up pressing zero to talk to a human. Right. So that company, it still needs humans to sort of pick up where the machines end. So it, it's not saving them a ton of money. It's not saving them a ton of headcount. It's basically this automation that is sort of just barely better or almost as good as a human. And these economists, uh, Asamoglu and Restrepo, write that this has been the dominant kind of automation that we've seen in the corporate world over the past several decades, not this kind of enormous step change in mm -hmm. productivity that would allow companies to do as much work or more with many fewer people. It's this kind of you know, this kind of mediocre so-so automation that they've been doing. And so that could help explain why we don't have millions of people out of work. You know, we were having a lot of kind of water cooler conversation about whether our jobs could be replaced by a robot. I remember looking online to see, you know, what are the odds that my job could be replaced by a robot? And it seemed like there were some that were more likely than others. But the thing that I found really interesting in Future Proof in your TED Talk is, you know, you've talked a lot about rather than our response being to compete with the technology and be more like the robots, that we should actually be more like humans. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I think that might seem counterintuitive to, to some people. Yeah, well, it was counterintuitive to me. Um, when I started researching this book, I went out and I talked to a lot of leading AI scientists, researchers, people who work in the automation field, and I was concerned principally with like, how do we as humans, what should we do if this big wave of automation is here, if it's going to put a lot of people out of work, if it's going to challenge us to sort of, you know, keep up, like, what should we be doing? And I thought all of these computer scientists and engineers were going to tell me, you know, oh, you need to go to coding boot camp, you need to become a programmer, you need to basically get as close to the machines as possible. And mm -hmm. instead, they kind of said the opposite. They said, you know, oh, well, you need to figure out things that you can do that can't be automated because that's where the opportunities are going to be. And that's going to be where the sort of safe zone is around all of this technology. So then the question obviously is like, well, what can't be automated? And right. in the book, I talk about three categories of work that I think are very unlikely to be automated anytime soon. Um, I call them surprising, social, and scarce. And can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be surprising, social, and scarce at work? Sure. So surprising work is just work that is irregular. It involves mm -hmm. lots of chaos or, you know, basically jobs that are, are very different from day to day. So like a, a kindergarten teacher would be very hard to automate, right? Because right. That, that job is just total chaos. Right. But, uh, you know, chess, for example, is very easy to for AIs to perform at superhuman levels because it's the same every game. You're playing on a fixed mm -hmm. board with the same rules every time. So the more surprising we can make our jobs, the more varied we can make them, the safer we are. Social, the second category of sort of protected work, is work that doesn't involve making things, it involves making people feel things. Mm -hmm. So if you are, you know, a therapist, if you are, uh, you know, uh, in, in the healthcare industry, and your job is really to like work with patients, if you're a, a teacher, if you are even someone like a, a barista could be a social job, if you are connecting with your customers and making them feel like they're getting more than just a cup of coffee from that exchange. Um, so the more social we can make our jobs, the more protected they are. And then the third category, scarce, is just these jobs that require like rare skills or combinations of skills or that involve sort of extreme high risk circumstances that we wouldn't trust to a machine. Mm -hmm. So the example I use in the book is the the 911 operator. Sure. So Today, if you call 911 to report an emergency, um, a human picks up, not a 
automated voice machine. And the reason that it does is because we've decided collectively as a society that that job is too important to entrust to a robot. You really need someone who's going to pick up, who's going to intuitively understand what's going on, and who's going to be able to make the right decision about how to respond. Yeah, I think in an emergency, I really don't want to get the automated response of in order to deal with what's kind of going on at the moment. So one of the things that I actually found surprising about your work is in talking about remote work. So I, I kind of expected as a technology guy that you would be a huge advocate for remote work, that you would just think that that was kind of the best thing ever. But then I saw a piece that you did that said, you know, working from home is overrated. And I'm just curious to hear kind of your take in this era of automation, at whatever pace it's happening, how does remote work either help or hurt us as people? Well, I, there's a lot of research on this, luckily, um, by people much smarter than me. And what the research generally shows is that people who work from home tend to be more productive than people who work in an office. And there are all kinds of reasons for that. I mean, if you aren't spending an hour or two a day commuting, if people aren't dropping by your desk, if you're not sitting in meetings all day, you can accomplish more, you can get more tasks done. So that's a plus for remote work. Um, but the research has also found that people uh, who work remotely tend to be less creative. They tend to have fewer new ideas. They tend to spend less time collaborating with people, generating the kind of creative collisions that we get in an office. Um, and that they're, they're, they tend to be less happy and less connected to their work than people who work uh, at least some of the time from an office. So, And, and I think we're, we're starting to see this play out where people who feel like their jobs are precarious, they actually want to be in the office. The, the people who are, are, are most eager to get back into the office are young people. Mm -hmm. um, they're people who aren't established in their careers, who are still kind of making the connections and building the networks and learning the skills um, and who are finding that that's much easier to do in in a physical office. So I think that part of the the issue with remote work, I mean, part of it is that, you know, if you work remotely, now your potential pool of replacements, people who could do your job, not only includes people who live in your city or, or you know, could commute to that office. It includes people who can do your job all over the world. Right. And it also includes robots. Right. Uh, because ultimately, um, you know, if an AI can do your job more effectively and you're not, you know, bringing anything more than your labor to a company, um, it's it's much easier to, to replace you. I think we're in a very fluid period right now where it doesn't necessarily have to be an either or proposition, you know, like I don't have to be remote 100% of the time, or I don't have to be in the office 100% of the time. And, and our research is showing that, you know, most companies are kind of shaking out somewhere in this middle zone of a hybrid work environment where people might be in the office two to three days a week or, you know, something like that. And I think it's likely to be kind of fluid, as, as you were saying, you know, if, for example, we came into a recession period, that might be a time where people might be more likely to say, hey, you know, I feel like we need to gather all the troops together. We need to be hands on. We have big problems to solve and we better all kind of do that together. In your book, you talk about being an end point or you're kind of coaching people to not be an end point. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit because I, I wasn't sure if I really understood what is the concept of a person being an endpoint. Yeah, so endpoint is a term from software development, um, and basically in, in uh, software development, that's why I didn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not a developer either, but I, I have talked to enough that I, I sort of learned their lingo. And and an endpoint is basically a piece of software that connects two applications. So if you you know have uh, dating apps like Tinder that wants to be able to pull in photos from your Instagram account. Um, they will write a program and connect it to the Instagram endpoint. Uh, and that program will sort of be the connective tissue that allows one program to talk to another. And a software developer I know um, said something that really stuck in my mind once, which is that a lot of people are essentially endpoints now. I mean, think about Uber drivers or Amazon warehouse workers, people whose jobs 
basically involve taking instructions from one machine and putting them into another machine. You know, mm. taking the the directions from a, a mobile mapping app and you know steering your car to where the machine tells you to go. Mm-hmm. Um, working in a warehouse, you're packing the boxes in the way that the machine tells you to and and sending them to the places that the machine tells you to. You're not a machine, you're not a robot, but you are effectively working as one. You are part of this robotic system. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that you haven't been replaced yet is because the machine can't yet do some little piece of that job. But those jobs, those endpoint jobs, and there are millions of them, those are the the first and easiest targets for automation. Mm -hmm. Because humans are this little sort of fleshy middle point in this fully automated system. And once the system can eliminate that human role, it's going to be much faster and more profitable for it to do so. Interesting. So another concept that you kind of zeroed in on is about collaboration and this idea of working with other people is also key to helping us thrive in automation age. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, this sort of goes to that second category of protected work, which is is social. Um, and meeting people's social needs rather than just their material needs is a huge industry. I mean, we have therapists, we have life coaches, we have executive coaches, um, we have, you know, people whose jobs are deeply social. And those jobs are hard to automate, not because you couldn't teach a chatbot to dispense uh, you know, executive coaching advice, but because what we're what we're paying for when we hire a life coach or a diet coach or a therapist is that personal connection. Mm-hmm. And so people in any workplace can make their jobs safer and less prone to automation by making them more social, by establishing those connections, by making sure that when you are doing your work, you're actually not just typing into a box and like doing it in a solitary way, but that you're building relationships and making people smile and helping them when they're in need. And like those kinds of jobs are are going to be much safer than the jobs where you're just a solitary genius, you know, pecking away at code in a basement somewhere. Got it. So Kevin, I want to pivot a little bit because uh, you started writing about a topic that is It's very hot on everybody's minds right now, but I I think you were kind of ahead of the curve when you wrote an article called The YOLO Economy, and you were identifying that people were starting to look for something else coming out of their work, something that was missing. Could you talk a little bit about what you were seeing and, you know, what is it that you think was kind of missing for a lot of people at work and what are some things that leaders might want to think about differently in order to make sure that we're meeting those needs that people have. Yeah, so the the YOLO economy was my attempt to like coin a term and and get it into the vernacular. Um, YOLO is short for you only live once, of course. And uh, unfortunately, I think that the term that ended up sticking was someone else's term, the great resignation. Yeah, But it's all sort of the same thing, which is that there was this wave of workers, many in sort of white collar industries, but also in in other industries, who sort of midway through the pandemic in 2021, early 2022, sort of decided that they weren't getting what they wanted out of their jobs, that they you know, we're missing balance, they were missing time with their families, they were missing novelty or adventure. And so they were just quitting. Mm -hmm. And they could afford to do it because they had some savings and their, you know, stock portfolios were up and they were getting stimulus checks. And so all of a sudden, you just had these people who were saying like, "Mm, I don't really need to be doing this anymore and changing the course of their lives entirely because they just decided that life was too short to be stuck at a job where they were unhappy. So I interviewed people from lots of different fields who had made sort of YOLO decisions around um, their jobs and also to employers who were trying to decide what to do about this. You know, should we try to keep these people? How, you know, how can we prevent people from getting so burned out that they quit? And I think there's a lot still we don't know about that. I mean, I think companies are really desperate to retain their best people And so I think, you know, part of the kind of flexible work push is sort of an attempt to do that saying, well, don't quit. Maybe you'd be happier if you worked 
from home or only came in one day a week or something like that. I think there's been a, a lot of companies that have attempted to sort of make work as flexible for people as possible in hopes that they won't quit and need to be replaced. And so I, I, I'm interested in doing a follow-up on that. Actually, it's been a while since I wrote that article because I think there's been um, a, a shift in some of these workplaces you know, maybe the companies are big tech companies and they, they don't have as much money as they used to. Their stock prices are down 30 or 40 percent. Right. And so I think they're actually seeing workers be a little bit more attached to their jobs and eager to keep them rather than sort of saying, well, I'll get another one tomorrow that pays more because I, I think they feel like the economy is turning a little bit. One of the shifts that we've been talking about a lot is really what is the experience people have when they go into the workplace. And we've talked about how, you know, maybe the original inspiration for the office was more factory-based or efficiency-based. And do we need to start thinking about the workplace to be more like thriving communities where people really feel a sense of belonging and connection? And so what I wanted to ask you before I let you go is you told a great story about a bookstore in your neighborhood. I think it's called Marcus Books. And it really thrived during a time where, you know, it seemed like the companies that were going to thrive and that were going to come out on top were all, again, maybe more technology focused or more automation focused. But yet Marcus Books was like a, a different story. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, Marcus Books is a black-owned bookstore in my neighborhood in in Oakland, California. It's actually the oldest black-owned bookstore in America. Mm -hmm. And um and I go there a lot. I buy a lot of books there and and I was sort of fascinated by its just resilience and survival. Um if you were going to start a business in the last, you know, 20 years, there aren't many worse ones than <laughs> independent bookstore. <laughs> They're just like yeah. a lot of them have gone out of business. It's very hard to compete with Amazon and other retailers. Um, and so I was just sort of like flummoxed by how this store seemed to be doing so well. So I, I did some research. I talked to the owner. And it turns out that basically, the, you know, I thought they were going to say, oh, well, we've been working on our e-commerce strategy and we've, mm -hmm. you know, lowered our prices to compete. And instead, it was sort of, again, this experience where I was just dead wrong because the owner basically said, like, yeah, we're, we're not really all that internet focused. Like, they didn't even really have a website where you could order books okay. as of a year or two ago. And yet they were, you know, they were super, super popular and profitable and thriving. And so I asked her sort of, how'd you do that? And she just said, in so many words, we cultivated a good vibe. That's awesome. People really like coming here. Um, you know, black patrons like coming here because they know that they're not going to be followed around and harassed by some security guard. Um, you know, families like coming here because they know it's a place where kids can, you know, discover books. And, you know, we have knowledgeable people who work in the store and can point people to where they go. It's just, it's got a good vibe. And I really like, I think that's a good... Um, sort of instructive lesson for businesses that are threatened by not only automation, but by competition mm -hmm. from huge, highly automated companies like Amazon. Uh, you're not going to outcompete Amazon on logistics, shipping time, right. price, inventory, you're just not going to be able to do it as an independent bookstore. But what you can do that Amazon can't do is cultivate a vibe. And so uh, that's that's sort of my advice to, to any business that feels like they've run out of options for competing with speed and efficiency and price. And I would just build on that and say for a lot of organizations who are saying, gee, I really wish my people would come into the office more often or, you know, maybe they need to focus on just cultivating a good vibe. So I, I, I love that. <laughs> this is going to be the, the name of my consultancy that I start someday. It'll just be like vibe cultivation. <laughs> or maybe it's a title um, of your next article or your next book, Kevin. Exactly. It has been such a pleasure to talk with you today. I really appreciate it. And I'm just going to go out and work on cultivating my vibe and leaning into my humanity instead of trying to compete with computers. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. 
I would like to welcome Michael Held, who is our Steelcase Vice President of Global Design. Thanks for joining me, Michael. Thanks, Chris. Hi. And I particularly wanted to talk to Michael because a few years ago, he wrote a piece titled, Will Creative AI Make Designers Redundant? And that title just sticks with me because I always worried in my job about with AI and uh, could my job be replaced by a robot? I never thought so because it's more creative, but AI is doing so many things now that we never thought that it could do. So I'm just curious, what do you think about all of that? Like, what do you think about the role of AI in our creative jobs? Yeah, I think um, the premise of this, I think, article from four years, um, I, I still stick to that, that um, at the end of the day, I think it's humans that create culture for humans. And mm -hmm. I think it's at the end of the day, it's us choosing what are the things that we want to automate, what are the things that we want other systems to be involved in. And um, at the moment, I think we use it as creative tools a lot. We play around with the technology. Um, we did that for years already. Writing has been a big thing. There are many mm -hmm. websites that are kind of automated, kind of uh, aggregated reviews, summaries of other websites. And in some cases, people don't mind. You know, they're okay with you know mm -hmm. automated responses. And some other times, you really do mind. You you want to have you want that human, human involved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You want to have the human connection. You want to have a level of trust that might be difficult to get any other way. So, what we see today with text to image, text to video, or speech to image uh, experiments on Dali, uh, Midjourney, and all these other kind of systems out there are super interesting. So AI is trying to guess what we what we imagine and is trying to give us images that we wouldn't maybe dream up ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we can refine those queries further and further. And there's already new jobs kind of uh, created. And, and somebody who is really good in, in, in asking or triggering those AI systems in the right way to create better images than someone else. These jobs didn't exist two years ago, but they do exist now. And uh, people are getting paid for it. And so it's impossible to even think about what these systems might be able to do in two years, five years, 10 years. And I'm pretty sure most of the things that we do today as humans could be done one way or the other by systems. But do we want that? Do we right. need that? I think it's really the question. And who makes those decisions? And I think this is where we tend to want to have humans involved. Yeah. I was really fascinated with Kevin pointing out that we could be very productive working from home and that all of the numbers, the data tends to tell us that people can get a lot done. Um, but he also pointed, and this surprised me to have a guy who's a tech writer arguing that they tend to also have less creativity or fewer ideas. And maybe they're spending less time collaborating with people. So I was curious what you thought about all of that. And can we create physical environments that maybe can help us build those kinds of connections that we might have missed if we'd been working remote or if we still are. Yeah, it's interesting how Kevin talks about these topics. I mean, he started with certain buckets of work that might be very, very difficult to automate. And one of mm -hmm. them was surprising. And I think this applies quite well to spaces as well, where um, the water cooler effect, we talk about serendipity. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that are really hard or impossible to transfer to a uh, remote work scenario because you don't schedule like 30 minutes for serendipity right. at home. Right. You don't have a computer system that randomly connects you to a coworker to then yeah. suddenly talk about something that yeah. you haven't thought about. Yeah. This is where physical space is a much, much better um, catalyst for these kind of interactions where you know, you have to go from point A to point B. And during that short amount of time, something can happen mm -hmm. that simply is not happening when you sit in front of a computer and you join the next call. Right. Nothing happens. You right. just join the next call. Right. And you're still aware at the same place where you are thinking probably exactly the same things. And so a physical space really helps us to be not comfortable all the time, mm -hmm. but also be uncomfortable once in a while or be surprised or be triggered by something or interrupted by something. And while in the moment that can feel less ideal, the outcome is often better than the monotony of sitting in front of a screen, not moving, joining, yeah. and hanging up. It's interesting when you talk about feeling uncomfortable a little bit, because I think 
I probably felt comfortable working in sweatpants, you know, when I was spending a lot of time at home. But the idea that the workplace can make us a little uncomfortable, you mean kind of push us out of our comfort zones? I think any environment where people learn needs to strike the right balance between being comfortable with a slight level of discomfort. Mm -hmm. I usually like when I observe myself, then um, the moments when I get uncomfortable are usually the moments where I learn the most. Mm. You don't want to be in that state forever. I mean, you don't want to be constantly under stress. Mm -hmm. But we humans need both states. And I think that's maybe what Kevin was getting at a little bit, like with, you know, there are certain things maybe we should be doing from home mm -hmm. because they're just kind of like working through a few tasks, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and. There are other things that we should definitely be together in the office. And so what is the right mix? And mm -hmm. how do we get people to come and enjoy the places? Like what's the kind of like right experience that mm -hmm. we need to create to help everyone to find that right balance for them? Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Kevin was talking about this bookstore, uh, Marcus Books in Auckland, where he lives, that, that is this great place for the community. And I think you mentioned that in our chat earlier that it just means so much more for the community than just being a transactional space mm -hmm. for buying books. Right. And I think in the same way, an office needs to be a space that is more for more than just for doing the tasks that are assigned to you mm. as part of your job. Mm. You're part of a community. It's a social element. Mm. You, you have coworkers. It's also a, a space where you don't necessarily have to agree with everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. I mean, a lot of people are in the social bubbles and um, you only talk to the people that think the same. They're already alike. And yeah. so you only get reinforced what you're already thinking. And I think a workplace right. is a place where people also get new ideas, different ideas, and once in a while maybe hear something that they personally think otherwise about. And, and that's okay as long as we you know, do this with, uh, with the right kind of values and, and treating each other right. And I guess that's, that's a little bit what this bookstore is maybe uh, doing for that community. It's a space to learn as well. It's a space mm -hmm. to kind of connect. It's a kind of space to meet people that are different, perhaps. And um, so a workplace should be doing that. And in the way it's, it's designed, should provide you a lot of different variety of spaces so that, you know, also that side of the story is not mm -hmm. just a monotonous kind of just get your task done. So this mm -hmm. is definitely a non-corporate space. Yeah. I love the way they described it, the you know, it was a space that had a great vibe. And I just love the idea that we should be creating places for work that has a great vibe. So anyway, I'm really glad that you could take the time to join me, Michael, and talk about this. So thank you for being here with me. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for being here with us for this episode of Work Better. If you enjoyed the conversation, please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and visit us at steelcase.com slash subscribe to sign up for weekly updates on research insights and design ideas delivered to your inbox. Next week, we're talking about hipsters, hackers, and hustlers. Simona Huja will be there to talk about how cultures of innovation need all three roles, the hipster, the hacker, and the hustler to succeed. Simone is CEO of Blood Orange, and she consults with some of the biggest organizations out there on innovation strategies. And she's also the author of Disrupt It Yourself. She'll share some really interesting research that she's conducted in India that led her to ideas around innovation. So please join us. Thanks again for being here. And we hope your day at work tomorrow is just a little bit better. This episode of Work Better is produced by Rebecca Cherbowski. Creative art direction is by Aaron Ellison and Emily Cowdery. Technical support is from Mark Caswell and Jose Jimenez. Digital publishing is by Aureli Ariano and Jordan Marks. And editing and sound mixing by Soundpost Studios. <laughs>